Harvard Divinity School. Teaching and Learning About Sikhism, September 29th, 2022. So hello again, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Anna Mudd. I'm here at Religion and Public Life at Harvard Divinity School, where our mission is to promote the public understanding of religion in service of a just world at peace. And I have the distinct privilege here at the RPL to work with educators in service of that mission, designing resources and professional development opportunities to enhance religious literacy in the classroom. And today we have the wonderful honor of connecting many of those educators with Dr. Simranjit Singh. So Dr. Singh is the executive director of the Religion and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. He is an equality fellow with the Open Society Foundation, senior advisor on equity and inclusion for YSC Consulting, and a visiting professor at Union Seminary. He's a regular contributor to the Washington Post, CNN, and Time Magazine, and writes a monthly column for Religion News Service. He's also the author of a best-selling children's book, and today I hope you'll join me in congratulating him on the publication of his most recent, recent book, The Light We Give, which as you can see is filled with my sticky notes. <laughs> and it's just an incredibly powerful and moving memoir about engaging with Sikh wisdom in service of a life committed to justice, connection, and love. So we are just so pleased to have you with us, Simran. Um, we have an audience of educators, ostensibly, the idea, and I think many will be interested both in your larger work in the service of justice and inclusion, as well as maybe uh, many may be interested in either starting or enhancing uh, the ways in which they're teaching about Sikh culture and history in their classrooms, whether that be a world religions class, a humanities class, a social science class. So lots of different places to dig in. Um, a little bit about our format. So Simran is going to offer some introductory grounding comments, then I'm gonna use facilitator's privilege um, to ask a few of my own opening questions. And then we're hoping to have a generous amount of time for questions from the audience to again, honor those different points of entry. So very excited for this lunchtime conversation. I hope folks are having lunch for the general ambiance. It's a nice way to connect. <laughs> but welcome again, Zimran. We're just so thrilled to have you with us today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, the introduction. Um, it's it's always a, a pleasure to to speak with educators. I think um, two two things that I want to note before even um, starting. One is uh, as an alum uh, of Harvard Divinity School, uh, especially um, meaningful uh, to be to be here with you all today. Um, and, and I even wore my 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 Harvard crimson turban uh, in in honor. Um, and 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 the other thing that that's really sort of striking me as I'm preparing for this is you know for me. Um, education has always been my theory of change uh, in this world, and, and, I, and I'm happy to speak about why, and uh, and, I, and I will. Um, but but the the sort of strange thing about reflecting on this conversation is I I knew from childhood that education is what I wanted to do. Um, religious literacy is in a term that occurred to me, uh, or that I encountered until much much later. Actually, even after finishing at Harvard and after finishing my PhD, I first started hearing uh, about the concept of religious literacy. And, and it's one of those things where um, you do it from your gut uh, for so much of your life uh, out of need, out of community need. And I, I'll, I'll share a little bit more on that in a moment. Um, but you don't realize until other people sort of put it forward and, and give you language for it, that, that this is what you've been doing and what you've been needing. So I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for the Religious Literacy Program uh, because it's serving a really important need uh, in, in our society and especially in our country uh, today. Um, by, by background, I was, I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, we were one of the only turbaned Sikh families uh, in all of South Texas at the time. Uh, my parents had moved there in the 70s. I was born uh, in 1984. Um, so it, it was a very, um, I mean, you might say it was a strange upbringing uh, in that, you know, it was unique. It was different from what most of my classmates and friends experienced uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And in many ways, it was very normal. And that's really important to me too, um, that, you know, it's it's easy to step in here and and look at someone who's different and say, oh, your your life was just filled with 
with terrible things that happen to you. And, and, and part of what I, what I want to explore today is how do we move beyond these, these flattening narratives uh, that, that end up, e even if they're sympathetic, um, that they can have dehumanizing impacts too. And so, so what are the other ways of telling our stories that can, that can enrich uh, and really bring to life the human dynamism that we each carry? Um, I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, for the first, I would say, 15, 16 years of my life, never encountered any resource or any uh, curricular approach to indicating that there was any awareness that my community existed. And, you know, looking back on that now, of course, we have conversations culturally about representation and its power. Um, but also, I, I think what the, what I want to think about today is the flip of that. What is what is the cost of our stories not being told? What, what is the cost of not hearing one another's voices? And, and effectively, what is the cost of not knowing one another? Right. If we're talking about cultural and religious literacy, uh, there's there's a real question of like why? What's what's the urgency and what's the need? And I can speak from a position of experience, my own lived experience as a Sikh growing up in this country, uh, that the cultural ignorance of not just my community, but, but many others uh, has real serious violent consequences. And, and I'll give you two examples, both of which in a way are extreme in that you know, they, they aren't necessarily representative of what everyone experiences. Uh, but they speak to the need um, and illustrate, I think, the real importance uh, of doing this work and, and doing it in the classroom. So the first, the first real touch point that I want to share with you all, you know, my my life growing up, very good in many ways, as I shared, and and littered with uh, encounters with racism as well. Right, both both are true. Um, and so in in two thousand one, when school had just started, I was a senior in high school. Um, racism was not new to me. Uh, but at the beginning of the school year, uh, a major incident happens uh, far away from Texas, uh, starting in New York, um, and it is a terrorist attack. And September 11th, I, I hear whispers about this in the morning. Um, we run to our high school teacher's classroom. We watch the towers come down. We don't speak for probably half an hour. Uh, many of you probably have similar stories where you hear about it. You're, you can remember what it felt like and what it looked like. Um, and, and I mean, we were just as 18 year olds, just dumbstruck, right? Like what is happening to our country? We'd never experienced uh, an attack on our soil. And it, I mean, up until that point, it probably felt, I mean, it felt like to me, uh, that we were always safe, right? There was, there was no threat. Uh, we were not vulnerable. Like, I mean, it, it, we, there was never any question about what would our lives look like under attack. And then now all of a sudden we felt attacked. We felt fear. And, and about half an hour into watching the news and the towers come down uh, with my classmates, we, we heard that there was a primary suspect and, and they show an image of a man I'd never heard of before, never seen before. Um, they said his name was Osama bin Laden and then they showed his picture and my heart just sank. Um, it was a man who was wearing a turban who had a beard, who had brown skin, just like me. And I knew in that moment uh, that life would not be the same. And, and it wasn't. Um, we went home that day. Um, we went home early. My mom picked us up from school, my brothers and me. The death threats started coming that day. Um, in the daytimes that followed, we would listen to and watch the news, trying to understand what had happened to our country. And in the evenings, we would gather around the phone and listen to conference calls where six would tell us about what was happening to them. And what we learned was there was an incredibly violent racist backlash that targeted anyone who was perceived to be the terrorist, to be the enemy of America, who would be the, seen as being affiliated with the perpetrators. And, and what I learned in this moment was that I could see myself as one way, Right, I could see myself as trying to live into the best of my values as a Sikh. And other people could see me entirely differently, right? They could see me as hateful and uh, misogynistic and violent and anti-American. And to a degree, up until that point, I could ignore what other people 
thought about me, right? I, I was taught to just turn the other cheek and let it go. And it's their ignorance. And I'd wonder what life would be like if we didn't have so much ignorance. But in this moment, I, I learned something different, which is other people's ignorance can have drastic consequences on our lives and our safety. And I watched life after life, friend after friend, I mean, just ruined uh, by our cultural ignorance. Uh, the first hate crime murder after 9-11 was a sick man uh, in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, the person who murdered him uh, saw him, I mean, the words he used in his statements to the police and to, to witnesses uh, included him saying he was going after ragheads, Iranians, Middle Easterners, Arabs. I mean, so many indicators that this person had a very racialized understanding of who the enemy was. And he saw a man who looked very much like me um, and said, that's the guy that I want to kill. That's the guy who's against our country. And so it, it became clear to me in this moment that not knowing one another really had severe consequences. And, and, and I wanted to be part of the change in this country to, to really start, start telling each other our stories. And so I, I went on track to become uh, what, what I at the time just described as a storyteller, right? I just wanted us to know one another and, and education was the best way I knew how to do that. So I went through college focused on uh, religion and race and literature and, and aspects like that. I went on to Harvard Divinity School and did my master's there. Still uh, a focus on South Asian religions, but with an eye towards education and social justice. Uh, and then I went on to do my PhD at Columbia uh, in South Asian religions. And, and one other experience I had while at Columbia that really opened up my eyes to the need uh, of this work uh, happened a few years later, uh, 2012, a white supremacist walks into a sick place of worship in Wisconsin uh, and massacres the congregation. And again, this person is motivated by hate and, and we can see what his ignorance and hate has uh, to bear on, on these communities who didn't know this person, right? They didn't have a relationship. It's not like he actually hated them as people. He hated the idea of them and didn't want them on the, on the face of this earth. And again, we see what cultural ignorance fuels, right? What are the consequences when we don't know one another? What, what's the risk of not having our stories known and heard? And part of what I, what I wanna say here is for so many people living on the margins, they're simultaneously rendered invisible Right. We don't know who they are. We never learn about them. Our schools don't teach us. I mean, where would we learn? And yet at the same time, they're hyper visible. They stand out to us wherever we go and whatever we do. And I mean, that's, that's true for me as I walk down the street. Nobody knows who I am, but they think they know when they see me based on their assumptions and their stereotypes. Now, when this massacre occurred in Wisconsin, in the few moments that followed, uh, there, there was another painful realization because the news anchors started referring to the attack as an attack on a mosque, um, as six being an offshoot of, of Hinduism, uh, as six being a sect of Islam. I mean, it was very clear to me that despite having been in this country for more than a century, despite comprising the world's fifth largest religion, even those who are, are cultural storytellers, right, our news leaders, uh, even though they had no clue who we were. And it, to me, it was just like a slap in the face. Like, of course, this is true. Of course, nothing has changed uh, in the last 10 years. And it's, it's probably time uh, for me to step forward. And instead of being so focused on the preparation uh, for education, I should just start get, getting into it and, and getting educating. And, and that's really what pushed me in many ways uh, to move into this work full force. Um, and, and there's two, two notes I want to share here about that. Um, one is, as we got into this work, we started to understand as a community um, that it's not just about telling your own story um, and being willing to do that. Uh, there's also a power dynamic here, right? Like who who gets to tell their own stories? How do we get opportunities to share about who we are? Uh, what, are, what, are the, what are the barriers to entry? And what are the gates that we need to open? And who are the gatekeepers? 
uh, so that we can have those opportunities. And that, that to me, uh, had not occurred to me before. Uh, of course, that's how the world worked, but I hadn't thought about this particular uh, issue in that way. So that, that was a surprise and a challenge uh, that we started to think about very seriously. And the second is, um, we started to understand that there is a particular challenge around uh, educating around religion. And I started to notice this uh, at first with journalists and then with educators. Um, I started to work in with journalists. I, I would do a lot of writing and sourcing on, on issues related to the Sikh community and religion more generally. And as I became friends with journalists, I, I learned that one of their hesitations was they, did, they just didn't want to get it wrong. Religion is too sensitive. Uh, it's too volatile. People can get offended. Uh, what if we mess up? And I said, well, what if there were resources that could help you? And, and one of the resources we developed and, and saw a great impact with was uh, an educator's guide. Uh, sorry, a, a, a journalist's guide to covering Sikhism. And, and we saw a big ramp up in, in coverage just with this resource. Uh, we wrote it with the Sikh Coalition and with the Religion News Foundation. And since then, we adapted it uh, as an educator's guide for teachers who said the same thing. We, we would love to, we just don't know where to start. Uh, and so we can, we can support that. And, and so that's been uh, another really powerful recognition here that some of the challenges we face are very human. Uh, we have fears, we, we have challenges, we don't know everything. And I think that's something that is hard to admit uh, in, in our culture today. And so uh, creating a culture where we can learn and grow and have that growth mindset, and then also supporting one another with resources. I think that's a really important way to go. So, so this is just a quick overview of who I am, how I got here. You can hear the sirens here in New York City. So uh, that's that's evidence that I'm really that I'm really here where I say I am. Um, yeah, this is, this is just an overview of of how I got to this place with regard to uh, understanding. Uh, religious literacy as a social justice issue, uh, as as a I mean, in in many ways for for my community, uh, as as an issue of survival, right? It is it can be the difference between life and death, and really understanding education um, and and awareness as as a mechanism for for positive change, cultural change, uh, cultural growth, and, and individual growth. I, I think that's a really important driver for for why I do what I do here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simran, for that incredibly critical and urgent uh, just argument for the work that so many on this call are doing, um, and also for a lot of that framing around the questions of storytelling and power. So my first two questions, I think, get at um, some of those themes and frameworks that you raised. Um, and I first wanted to ask about this intersection of teaching about race and religion. So a large part of uh, the light we give is in many ways your lived experience at this intersection of religion and racialized identity. And in chapter five, you say um, it became clear uh, you live this and, and you also study it and you narrate that story as well. You say it became clear that we can't understand American racism without understanding its religious roots. And you give three reasons why there. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about those reasons. Um, and how you see teaching about race and racism is deeply connected to teaching about religion and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the question. Um, there's there's so much to say here. So I'm, I'm, I wanna make sure I'm starting in the right place, but I guess, you know, maybe the right place is, is my lived experience. Um, let me start here. So often when I talk about Islamophobia and I, you know, as a scholar now I teach about Islam and Buddhism and other traditions. When I talk about Islamophobia, people will say, well, how can Islamophobia be racism? Uh, Islam is not a race. And I understand uh, the point. <laughs> it's not always a good faith argument, uh, right? So, so let's, let's start there. But also it, it, it indicates a, an oversimplified view of, of what racism is and how it functions. And what I can share with you based on my lived experience is I am absolutely racialized in this country. And a large part of that has to do with my religious identity, right? When I walk down the street and people look at me, the first thoughts that typically come to their mind are on the basis of their racial stereotypes. 
right? Terrorist, Al Qaeda, ISIS. I know that's what they're thinking because so many of them say that to me, right? Like that's that's part of it. And so the challenge I think um, in terms of connecting religion and race is that so often uh, our modes of analysis are uh, isolated into, well, what is going on here? Is it this issue? Is it that issue? And, and part of what we've learned uh, through, through some of the stellar work of uh, ethnic studies and uh, racial justice scholars is that our identities are intersectional. And, and, and one way of saying that is to say, well, we have multiple identities. Another way of saying that is to say, hey, just because you see yourself in a certain way doesn't mean everyone else sees you that way. And that to me, that, that realization after the terrorist attacks in 9-11 really opened up my eyes to understanding like the, the perceptions that people have based on whatever biases they carry. Um, you don't, you don't, we don't really control those. And so let, let me, that, that, that's one aspect of, of the intersection of race and religion that I think is really important for us to understand in this country. A second um, has to do with the, the way in which American racism has been constructed uh, through religious actors and institutions. And the place to begin, I think, is at the very foundation of America. Uh, when the European colonizers first came to this country, the justification that they carried came through the church, right? The papal bull uh, from the Pope that said, essentially, anyone who's not Christian can be converted and colonized, right? You have the right to their land. Essentially saying these people aren't human enough for them to claim their own land. You're better than them. You're more human than them. And it creates a, a real basis of supremacy, right? The, the better and worse model is, is supremacy and we can call it that. And so understanding that as we're talking about supremacist institutions in this country, they're not just on the basis of race and ethnicity, right? Yes, whiteness is an important element of that, but so is Christianity. And until we take that seriously, we won't really be able to get at the root of the problem, right? You really have to dig in and understand that. And, and a similar note here that I think is really important for us to get is it's not just the historical foundation, it's also how it's been perpetuated over the years. And we can look at many examples that we learn about in our schools or we see on the news and, and we, we don't really do a good job of connecting the dots necessarily. But, but looking at, for example, the role that interpretations of the Bible played in the formation of the KKK. I mean, that's race and religion coming together. I mean, literally these people are riding around on their horses with white cloths on their heads, Bible in their hands, burning crosses. I mean, what's going on here? It's race and religion together. And our unwillingness to see that, or at least our uh, attempts to look away from that are really hurting us because until we really understand the problem, we're not going to be able to address it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that critical articulation and just for the large body of public education and scholarship going even deeper into these issues. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we do have some questions in the chat box, but um, a related question, such as switching gears slightly. Um, so almost every educator we work with, right, has tremendous constraints on their time and content coverage. They're often covering in one day or in even less time an incredibly complex tradition, topic, um, and in those situations, one of the things that we tend to encourage educators to think about as sort of a guiding pedagogical principle is what fundamental assumptions do you want to disrupt with your students about this topic, about this tradition, whether it's a dominant cultural assumption, whether it's assumptions that students are bringing into the classroom, uh, that's sort of a core habit of mind in our teaching. I'll show you, I found we, it's so core, we even have a disrupt your assumptions bracelet here in the office. Um, so on that note, I wanted to ask you uh, just to say a few words about what are some of you, you talk a great deal about this in some ways in your book, but um, what are some of the central or primary misunderstandings um, about Sikh tradition that you would hope educators in the room here or more broadly might be disrupting or challenging with their students um, when engaging with this topic? 
Yeah, I love I love the question and I love I love the bracelet. Um I'm I'm all about that. And and you know, part of what we learn in education um is the approach of scaffolding. Right. So so one of the big frustrations I had as a student who grew up in the public schools of Texas and then went on uh to higher level education was we learned we learned narratives that made sense to us as kids. And then as we got older, the, the rug was pulled out from underneath us, right? Like Columbus is a hero who uh, really saved this country. And then you get to college and you start studying history and you're like, oh my God, like what, what did this person do uh, to all these other people? Like it's, it's, it's ridiculous the way that we set our kids up for real shock. And, and religion is, is an even more difficult one because when I was teaching Islamic studies in Texas, uh, after getting my PhD, my students would come into the classroom and they literally would only know about Islam on the basis of what they saw in film and TV. Like no one would talk to them about it. There was nowhere to learn. And so they knew many of them, most of them, that what they had in their heads was biased and problematic, but they didn't know what to do with that. And so so part of what, what I think about in terms of education and religion in general is not just the disruption, but actually how do we start? So we get to a place when these kids are 18 years old, uh, they're not getting a slap in the face as if, I mean, as if they're entering into an entirely new world that they didn't know about before. I mean, it's it's too late at that point when they're 18, they're adults, right? Like we need to begin earlier. And so scaffolding to me is, is an approach that's really important. Introduce early, um, you know, start at the early childhood levels. Uh, I have two girls, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and we are constantly trying to introduce them to different cultures and traditions and, you know, not just religion, but different ways of life that are different from theirs. And that is part of how you cultivate uh, that empathetic worldview and also uh, the openness to difference, right, rather than a fear of difference. And I think as as people get older, uh, then you can start working against some of the frameworks that society teaches them that are problematic or incorrect. Um, and when it comes to religion and when it comes to Sikhism in particular, there, there are a few that I would really advocate for. The first is, if one is to recognize that this is of the major world religions, this is probably the most underrepresented in, in literature and in, in the academy, then, then this will be easier to follow. But essentially, most textbooks on religion, most of us who have studied religion have never encountered uh, Sikhism in our classes, right? Even if you look at major volumes, like, like from Houston Smith or, um, I, I don't know, Karen Armstrong, like they'll talk about every other religion uh, but Sikhism is always left out. And, and then what happens is, and I've you know studied this and written about this, is when Sikhism is included, it's a very um, outdated, outmoded, orientalist view of what Sikhism is. And so the standard narrative is Sikhism emerges in a context where Islam and Hinduism are coming together in early modern South Asia. That's true. Um, it comes from a reformer who was born into a Hindu family who essentially said, let's mix these two religions together so everyone can get along. And, and what's funny about this is, uh, well, one, the, the model of syncretism that we, uh, that so many scholars in religion used to advocate for is, is no longer uh, a way that we think about religion, right? Because of all, I mean, all, all the problems of syncretism. So like, that's something we still accept when it comes to Sikhism. And um, the, the other challenge here is if you actually get to know the tradition, uh, all the elements that you would expect from a major world religion uh, are there, right? It has its own unique founder, its own unique scripture, its own unique belief system, its own unique ceremonies, uh, its own unique community centers. I mean, the the actual intention uh, and under self-understanding of the tradition is completely different from the scholarly presentation of it. And that becomes a real challenge for educators because even when I was in high school, my teachers would say, okay, I don't know what to do about Sikhism. Like, would you do it? Which is of course not, not where you wanna be as an educator, um, but it was fine and it was fair and I was open to it. 
But what we would find is what I would share would be at variance with what she would find in her books. And then who do you believe? Do you believe someone who is a practitioner, but a 15 year old, right? Like that's hard. And of course there is internal bias there too. Like this is my version of this tradition. Or do you believe a textbook? And of course, you know, educators are inclined to believe the textbooks, but in, in my view, so many of these textbooks are problematic. And so I think one place to begin is really to, to interrogate uh, the, the standard narratives of, of Sikhism and, and to really look at, well, what are the, what's the latest here? What are the scholars saying now? Uh, and I think what you'll find consistently is um, a new representation, which, which is part of what I'm trying to sh share here. That, that Sikhism is an independent religion, stands on its own, has its own, all of these different elements. Um, and, and this is the self-understanding of the community too. So that's one. And then, and then the other one that I'd wanna jump to um, is something I referred to earlier, which is when the Sikh community is presented um, and with all the best intentions, it typically is presented uh, in the context of hate violence. and. That's an important story to tell, especially in the modern American context. Um, but one of the challenges then becomes, as I was saying before, um, it is perpetuating a victim narrative, um, which makes sense to a degree, right? This community is marginalized, is targeted, is attacked over and over again. Um, and there's so much more to these people than who they are, other than who we present them to be in, in that context. And so my, my, gentle <laughs> request would be, sure, do that, like share share those stories, they're important, uh, but maybe also build in, well, how did the community respond and, and give them back some of their agency and show their resilience uh, in those stories that you share. Uh, I think that's really important for us as educators to think about, this is not, these people aren't just what happens to them, they're also what they do and how they live. Uh, and there are some really important elements of Sikh philosophy that I think are built into their responses. And I think there are all sorts of other kinds of stories uh, that you can find in American history and in the modern day uh, in which six figure into significantly uh, that are not uh, just tied uh, to the hate that we endure. Fantastic, thank you so much. Well, we have quite a rich stack over here in the Q&A. So I'm actually, Simran, going to invite you to take a look as well. Um, we'll have time to get to quite a few of these. Um, why don't you start where we uh, decide where, we, where you want to dive in? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I see a message from Ben who's asking a question that I think about a lot, uh, which is, when speaking and teaching about Sikhism and sharing your lived experiences, how do you avoid the trap of being tokenized by people who aren't Sikh, by non-Sikhs? How do you navigate non-Sikhs using your perspectives and experiences as a stand-in for the spectrum of Sikh experiences and voices? And it's it's such a good question because um, tokenization is, is, is real. Um, it happens often. And, and I think, you know, for for a very human reason, right? We don't know what we don't know. And when we encounter someone who is willing to tell us something, then we take that at face value. And, and that makes sense. And, and one of the challenges for me is not just, it's not just my lived experience. It's also that I am, I'm a scholar of religion whose who's training uh, has focused in on, on the historical formation of the Sikh community. And so in this country, where you know six are not here in big numbers. We're about five hundred thousand in the U.S. Uh, and even smaller in terms of visibility. Uh, in this country, it is often the case that I am the first sick that someone has a conversation with, at least about their tradition. Uh, and I'm a scholar of the faith, and so people will, will will think and say, "Oh, well, this guy's telling me the real the real truth." And one of the challenges, and it, I mean, it was a big challenge for me in writing my book. Uh, about Sikh philosophy is, as a scholar, one of the things I learn uh, about religion, and I know this is a big component of the, the approach that Harvard takes religious literacy. One of the things I've learned is Sikhism is not just one thing. What I present in this book is, I mean, it's, 
it's my interpretation of Sikhism. It's my lived experience of Sikhism. And I'm very intentional throughout the book and, and whenever I speak about, sh about sharing that. But, you know, part of, part of the challenge, Ben, is um, even when you do that, you, can, you can't control um, how much other exposure people have uh, through other channels. And so even, even when I say, I'm not speaking on behalf of all six, I'm not essentializing Sikhism in my representation of it. I'm not saying Sikhism believes X, Y, Z. I say, I believe as a Sikh X, Y, Z. Even then other people might take that as a representative statement of, of what all six believe. And that one, that's a really hard one to control. And so the, the answer is I do my best. I try to be conscious of it. I recognize there's also a power dynamic here in terms of me also now having a platform to tell the stories. And, and so part of my solution is what can I do to ensure that other six stories and voices are heard so that we get a full spectrum of opinions and interpretations and experiences. Uh, and then, and then we can, I, I think that's, that's really the best way of getting to a place. Uh, where where tokenization is is behind us and and authentic representation is in front of us. So thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. A phrase we sometimes offer to teachers dealing with the question of sort of contested authenticities is that diverse devotional re uh, representations of a tradition are authentic but not exclusive. To get out of that exclusivist sort of binary paradigm and recognize that multiplicity. I was going to lift up Matthew's comment because I know we've heard this from multiple educators. Uh, Matthew asks, how do you combat a parent, adult in the room who may not want to engage in interfaith education in fear of their children, students being indoctrinated or converting? I run an interfaith youth organization and run into parents and houses of worship that will be tentative to engage in fear of their youth changing religions due to our programming occurring at the identity development stage. Yeah, it's a good question, and and I I I know you have some wisdom to share here too. So I'd, I'd love to hear your two cents. Um, I will say I will say briefly, and 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 Matthew, I know I'm, I'm I, I know you do too. So I appreciate appreciate the question, and and I uh, I'm glad we're uplifting it because I know it's a concern for for many educators. Um, you know, part of part of what we can do, um, you know, I'm I'm speaking for a moment. Uh, as a parent who went last night to his daughter's curriculum night uh, for first grade and uh, met with the teacher and they talked through their approach and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And I think just that transparency, I mean, they, were talk they weren't talking about religion, they were talking about writing and math and kindness and values, uh, but the transparency from the teacher, I mean, my wife and I walked away last night feeling so reassured, uh, knowing that there was so much more to what our daughter was getting than what she told us at dinner at night, which is nothing like nothing. What'd you do? Nothing. Who'd you play with? No one. <laughs> right. That's, that's sort of the standard experience. And so the transparency of, Hey, we're, we're talking about religion, but we're doing it in this way. We're doing it for these reasons. Uh, I think that will, that goes a long way uh, from a parent's perspective. And I've seen this as an educator too. Uh, when you are, when you place the trust and confidence uh, in your students, for me, it's it's college and graduate students. So I'm not dealing as much with parents, but even when you do it with younger students and their families, and trust that they can receive what you have to say in terms of your approach, and to say we're not here to privilege a particular religion, we're not here to push a certain religion, we're not here to say that some are better than others. We're just here to help your kids understand the world and how it works and the kinds of things that they will encounter as they get older. I mean, I love that. I mean, of course, that's what I want for my kids. And I want that in terms of history and math and other kinds of people skills. And this is one of them. And so last thing I'll say, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you on this too, if you're open to it. Um, as I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, religion is is tricky for a lot of people. We are becoming more comfortable in this country talking about race, talking about gender, talking about sexual orientation. Um, but religion is not yet um, off limits, right? We 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 keep it in timeout. We avoid it when we can, and and I get it. Uh, I understand why. But we are we're suffering uh, because of our inability to understand one another. And religion is such a salient part of people's identities. 
it's such a big force in the world and we're really depriving our kids when we're not sharing it. I understand that I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but being able to communicate that to parents who are resistant and to show them what is the value, what is the upside, how is this going to serve your kids as they get older and move into the world? I, I think that's the best way to get them on board. Absolutely. And Simran, I would just really echo a lot of what you said. So typically what we talk about is just an incredible level of transparency and an explicit articulation of the how and the why in entering into this content is just non-negotiable and a critical piece of the curriculum arc and of the pedagogy. And that includes not only um, couching the sort of how and the why in a broader historical legal context, but the teacher really articulating how this relates to their own uh, pedagogical theory of change, what they understand to be the purpose of education. Uh, Professor Moore often talks about that this can often be linked to the mission statement of the school, that if you go back to that mission statement, you're very often going to find um, articulated values that are then expressed within the stated goals of religious literacy frameworks. Um, and particularly to spend careful time reviewing the concept of distinguishing between devotional and non-devotional study of religion, which can sound like a truism, can sound very clear, but there always has to be this presumption of an assumption that learning about religion is in some ways devotional, whether that's implicit, whether that's not on the surface. Um, and just to invite folks in to uh, the rich world history complexities of the academic study of religion for whom, you know, many of folks for whom this is their first introduction and it's incredibly inspiring, exciting. Um, and that level of articulation and transparency, you know, it enriches any curricular module to give a real clear sense to students and parents this is why this is how this deeply connects to my understanding of purpose of education and what we're all doing here. We also have we have at least one teacher in our network who teaches a hold an optional parent night where parents can come, I think, once a month and do sort of a, a, a sped up version of the curricula that their students are doing for a month. So there's full transparency to alleviate anxiety. Now, that's not. Um, not everyone has the bandwidth to do that, but inviting parents into the learning process is also incredibly powerful. And I was going a similar about the sort of how question also, um, I was gonna bring in Allison's question and maybe uh, specifically Simran, you can speak to the guide that you put together that you had mentioned. So she says, good morning from California. Your comment and revelation around gatekeepers stood out to me. Your movement to create educators guides is highly inspiring. In the current space I work in, guidebooks are considered optional. How can we encourage, especially gatekeepers, that these guidebooks are necessary and mandatory? In essence, how do you recommend we influence without formal authority? Mm, that's a great. It's a great question, and I think part of part of the challenge here is um, teachers are overworked um, and underpaid, and and are we really? Are we really right to ask them to do more work? I mean, that's a really hard ask. And, and there are so many, even if we do ask them to do more work, there are so many competing issues uh, that need improvement. Uh, and and how, do we, how do we prioritize this one? And so to me, uh, your, your question, Allison, uh, at the, the end of it, uh, how, do we, how do we bear this influence without formal authority uh, is, is the real question, right? It, it doesn't really work to take a top-down approach and and legislate that teachers need to do this and that and whatever um, because you you don't really get um, I, I don't think it's an effective strategy in terms of actually getting to that point and also even if you did uh, the teachers wouldn't have the resources or uh, the the willingness to execute on it and so so what's a different approach and, and what has worked on my side and this is this has been true in the education space and in the media space, which is let's let's go back to this premise that and, and this truth that teachers are overworked and underpaid. If instead of giving them more work to do, we instead say, hey, let us help you. Let us give you some resources that'll make your job easier and help you achieve your goals. Uh, that that creates a different kind of dynamic. And what I found is so often in life, um, the entry points are not as um, formal as we think they are. 
uh, it's actually through a relationship. And so building a relationship through educator networks, um, creating some friends and saying, Hey, I'm here, I'm here to help you. I'm here to serve you. We have a shared mission uh, in helping our kids. Um, part of your mission is to do this. I know it's outside of your range of expertise. I happen to have some resources for you. I mean, we've, we've been doing that. The organization that I work for, um, in, in this capacity is the sick coalition. Uh, we have developed so many strong relationships with educators who have used our materials and have said, thank you for the lesson plans. Thank you for the, the reading lists. I mean, over and over again, it's just taking work off the plate of these educators who would love to do this if they had the time to do it, but how, how, where would they have time? They just don't. Uh, and so I really think the informal networks are the way in. Um, really going from teacher group to teacher group. And of course, that's a painful uh, way to um, to get anything done. Um, it's, it's more of a grassroots approach. Um, but I think what you'll find and, and what I've found is as you start connecting in and, and people of goodwill who appreciate what you're doing will plug you into the next network and the next network. And so that's that's what I found to be a more, more effective strategy than, than going from the top down. Anna, Anna, what have you seen on your side? Yeah, I echo a lot of that, especially the necessity of framing of taking something off the plate versus putting something on is just critical. And not only because teachers are overworked and underpaid, right, but it's essential to the sort of core of our argument about religious literacy, right, is that it's already there. Teachers are already, you know, teaching it. When I was teaching the Massachusetts eighth grade world history standards, it was probably 80% content that was explicitly engaging with these questions, but that as teachers, um, we, when I was in the classroom, now as I engage with teachers, feel just uh, incredibly often unprepared, and there's a lot of anxiety in how they address it. So it, often it's addressing what's already present in the curriculum. It's making visible um, that which is perhaps a little bit more latent, even than that explicit content, but it's already there, and it doesn't need to be a huge shift. It can be, again, surfacing, making visible, asking different questions with different habits of mind. Um, it can be small interventions that introduce different levels of complexity. And then you're asking different questions about religion, asking that religion question differently in your life. Um, I'll say also just on a small pragmatic piece, something we've really encouraged with our professional development, especially the more fulsome summer institutes, is to have teachers come as a pair or cohort just because there's so much more power there um, and less loneliness. You know, again, an experience I had as a teacher, you go to a conference, wherever it may be, you get really jazzed about it. And then you come back to your home institution and sometimes the enthusiasm isn't there. And that can be for any topic, let alone one that can be as fraught as religion. So when teachers come in as a cohort, as a pair who are mutually excited about this and have some energy to do a little bit of peer-to-peer -peer, um, engagement, peer-to-peer -peer training, often that force, and again, as you said, those informal networks within a district or a school really create more shift than when it's just isolated teachers and then going home to a district with folks. You know, it's a lot, it's a big lift <laughs> sometimes to get uh, this kind of awareness and new frameworks in there. Right. So I think I was going to try and use my third question. It might be kind of fun to, to end on a little bit here. We can see if there's others we can get to. But um, yeah, uh, Simran, one of the things you and I messaged about was that I was very interested that, especially in the first couple chapters of your book in your young life, um, there's a fair amount of humor present, jokes, um, sometimes with proximity to violence, sometimes not but it's very present and it really stood out to me because I know a good number of teachers in our educator networks use the work of comedians, use comedy very specifically to sort of offer complexity and humanization to um, communities that are often seen as, you know, one dimension or one dimensional or stereotype. And there's a very, and it's not, you know, comedy and kids is great, but there's something very particular I think that comedy can do in that space. Um, and so I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that and uh, uh, the role that humor plays in your work as a storyteller um, and an educator. Yeah, thank you. That's um, of everything. That's probably the most important thing thing you, you could say about um, the book. Trying to be funny uh, was was a big goal. In fact, my editor for a long time edited 
uh, Calvin and Hobbes and the far side gallery. And one of the reasons I agreed to work with him was because I thought he could make me funnier, which he did. So, so, so thanks to him. Um, yeah, you know, the, this point about humor, you know, to some degree, it's like, it's, it's a strategy. And to some degree, it's just who I am. And, and I think part of my experience growing up, um, and I, I think people who live on the margins in, in, in any capacity could, could perhaps identify with this. Uh, part of the way you learn to survive the challenges you endure daily is to learn not to take them so seriously uh, and to, and to, to deal with them with some levity, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, someone saying something to you on the street and you trying to think of something funny to say back, or you have some friends who you like joke about it, or for me, it was my brothers so often. Um, and so in, in some way you could call it a, a survival tactic. Um, in some way it's, it's just, you know, when you're writing about yourself, you want your voice to be authentic. Uh, and to represent who you really are. And I, I'm not someone who's always serious and really heavy. Like the lightness is, is really part of uh, my daily life. And I wanted that to come through. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you noticed it because that was really important to me. Um, another, another reason for humor in the classroom um, at the age level I teach is, is a way to um, uh, keep kids awake. <laughs> right you gotta you gotta try all the tactics like as as teachers now uh we are we are performers as much as we are anything and so uh keeping them on their toes and making sure they're having a good time is, is really important to me pedagogically uh but but the to your, to your question about what does it do functionally uh in terms of disrupting stereotypes like like the on the surface level um yeah absolutely one of the one of the elements is to say, yeah, I am I am this guy who talks about racism and talks about religion, which people expect to be really heavy, intense topics. And I'm also a guy who can joke around and who likes pop culture and who likes sports. And you know, that's getting back to this point about not flattening one another um, and not falling into the traps of stereotypes, like showing the fullness of who we are. Like that's the fullness of who I am. And so that's that's a really important, I think, instrument uh, for for pushing against some of these um, these tropes uh, that are so easy uh, to to fall into. And, and and the other part of it that that I think really speaks to me in terms of humor as an instrument is, you know, the the original vision for this book was let me write a introduction to Sikhism. And it would just be like facts and information. And as over the over the five last five years, especially, we've learned that facts and information don't necessarily move people, right? Science doesn't even move people. It doesn't change people's minds. And so what is it that can actually help open people up rather than shutting them down? And humor, humor does two things in this regard, right? Like, humor opens you up interpersonally by saying like, Hey, I'm, I'm a human being. You're a human being. Let's like hang out. We don't need to be so serious and like at each other's throats, but it does something else sometimes. And that is humor can show how ridiculous some of our assumptions are sometimes in ways that don't come across when you say it flatly or plainly. Right. So for someone to tell me to go back to where I came from and for me to yell something angrily back at them, like what happens? Nothing, right? Like we just walk away being angry. Um, but instead, if I can turn that into some like joke about, you know, where I came from being Texas or New York or, you know, the restaurant I was just sitting, whatever it is, like it, it creates a different kind of openness, but also that person's like, oh, I thought that guy was from another country and like, maybe I'm doing something wrong here. Maybe I'm maybe like, it, it just creates a different opening. And so the, the disruption that can happen through humor in a way that undercuts dichotomies or hypocrisies uh, in ways that helps people self-reflect um, and be like, wait, why is this funny? Or like, what, what, what was I coming into this conversation with thinking? And what am I walking away with? Like that, that has a different kind of progressive move. And, and I think that can be really powerful. Absolutely. I was hoping we'd get to hear your Texas drawl. 
Oh my God. I did it for the audiobook and it's it's the one thing that I'm uncomfortable about. I hadn't done it in like 20 years. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, I think we have time for one more. I was thinking maybe Pamela's comment here. Uh, she says, Simran, love your book, The Light We Give, which gives me so much hope and guidance navigating life with a life with a transgendered kid. As a parent and educator, I agree it's important to allow college-aged adult students an opportunity to tell their stories, perhaps by giving them multiple project-based assignments so they can connect with and interview people in the sick community. I have found that our cultural ignorance is because students may not know someone in a particular community. It's easy to turn a blind eye and continue in your bubble. What projects have you asked students to do in your classes? How do you make sickism more visible that students see our shared humanness across religions. Mm, thank you, thank you, Pamela. I appreciate all of that. Um, the one of one of my favorite assignments. I mean, this is like anthropology one hundred and one. Um, it's I, I just make people go out and meet people, um, and you, it's easier to do at the college or graduate level. Um, but I, I, you know, I'll say we've been reading books telling us about what, right now I'm teaching a course on uh, Buddhist history. So, so I'll say we're, we've been reading about Buddhists and what everyone has to say about Buddhists, but what do, what do Buddhists actually have to say? Like go, go out and talk to one or two and report back. And, and what I find is consistently, my students will go in with the intention of asking them about their beliefs, right? Like that's our bias societally, like we want to know what people believe and that's what's different. Uh, but it turns into a conversation about life, like their views on life, how they live, and like what else animates them. And what they'll what they'll learn usually is like for most of these people, so much of their lives are driven by their perspectives, but also they go beyond like just the sort of categories that we put them in. And I think that to me, like to your point initially, Anna, about disrupting people's assumptions, like that's that's a big one, right? Like being able to see that these religions are not just lived on a page and then are monolithic across communities, but really like every person has their own way of living into their faith. Like, I love that exercise. And I think it's something that can be done at every level. I'm thinking of my six-year-old now, like she would get it. Like she doesn't necessarily have all the same assumptions we do, um, but she has some based on what she's learned about religion and race and gender so far. So I, yeah, I think, I think that's a really, it's a really simple exercise, but one that can really push, push forward and against, against some of our assumptions. Thank you. The, the other, the other point that I'll make to your other question about making Sikhism more visible um, is, is one thing I love to do. And I do this across the traditions that I teach um, is to show how, how I'm uh, history, um, which which I do and I cover, and I you know I'll talk about the founders of whatever faith I'm teaching and principles, etc. Um, we'll also spend time talking about modern expressions, and this will include people who claim themselves as like faith inspired, uh, but also people who identify as Sikh or Muslim or Hindu or whatever, and are also just like actors or pop stars or poets. And I mean, there are tons of them all around us and helping, helping students see that gives them a different perspective into what these religions look like in real life. Absolutely. That was my last question I didn't get to. Are there any, Simran, are there any uh, folks in that sphere you want to name check? Oh, activists, so many. Activists, culture makers, folks that uh, people could bring into their curriculum, introduce students to that really brings in that contemporary, internally diverse element. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Gurinder Chad does film my views in the classroom. That's a uh, bandit like Beckham. I mean, it's it's one of those. It's just a good movie, and it happens to be about a sick family. Um, I really love it, um, and and I'm also a soccer fan, so that's that's a nice bonus for me. Um, Miss Marvel, the the new series on uh, on Disney Plus, uh, talks a lot about partition, which is a central experience of of many South Asians, uh, and especially six. Um, and there's a there's a really cool sick musician uh, who's featured on there named Ragin. They're saying, um, and so that's that's been a cool thing for me to expose my kids to, and just be like, hey, look at look at the different kinds of things that are showing up within religion. And then and then poetry has actually been. I think there's a long tradition of writing in poetry. In our community, but Rupi Kaur, uh, Harman Kaur, um, in literature, just Singh, uh, Valerie Kaur's new book, which is she's also a Harvard alum, 
um, yeah, there's, there's so much out there. So yeah, I, I'm happy to point people towards more resources and expressions um, that, that sort of speak to sick experiences around the world. Phenomenal. Well, we are right at the hour. What fantastic timing. Um, Simran, tremendous gratitude. I learned so much. I think this was a really rich conversation. Thank you, everyone who joined. These were fantastic questions. Um, and I haven't been keeping track of the chat, but hopefully um, our colleagues have been putting in some links um, to some of the resources that have been referenced. So Simran, did you put the guide in the chat? Um, I wasn't able to send it to all the people in the chat. I don't think I have the privilege to do that, but if you don't mind dropping it here, um, I think it might be useful for educators. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do that and put in um, over at the RLP, we have some new modules for educators, case studies, um, and uh, self-paced learning opportunities, and uh, also opportunities to sign up for our newsletter. So I think with that, we'll again say just tremendous gratitude, Simran. This was lovely. Thank you for the lunchtime chat uh, and just for your tremendous work as a public scholar. My pleasure. Great to be with you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you to the whole team. Appreciate it. Sponsor, Religion and Public Life. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.